seen such desolation. You just, I think we drove for a mile and there was no building hardly standing. Nobody knew what was going on. They called the situation fluid, but fluid means that nobody knew anything. It was different. If I had done something else, I don't know what I would have done. We're talking today with Mike Hale of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, Mike, can you start us off with some background on yourself? Uh, well, I was born in Muskegon uh, way back in 1946 and have lived there all my life. Uh, went to school there until eighth grade. Then I went to a, a junior military academy, uh, Barber Hall Junior Military Academy in uh, Nazareth, just outside of Kalamazoo. From there, for high school, I went to Marmion Military Academy in Aurora, Illinois, about 40 miles west of Chicago. Okay. Now can you back up a little bit? Uh, what was your family doing for a living when you were a kid? My dad was a, uh, a dentist, and my mother was a stay-at-home mom, like most people were back then. Okay. And uh, okay. I enjoyed my life, uh, great parents. Uh, so how'd you wind up in military academies? Um, I was tested, my IQ was tested, and they figured that maybe I wouldn't uh, do well in public school, nothing against public mm -hmm. schools, uh, and they asked me if I wanted to go, and it seemed like it would be interesting and a challenge, mm -hmm. so I said, sure, why not? So off to boarding school I went, which didn't bother me in the least, uh, some acclimation. Mm -hmm to getting used to a boarding school environment, you know, not seeing your parents for a period of time, but I enjoyed it. And uh, consequently, I tested for uh, Marmion, which mm -hmm. is a college prep right. academy, and went there for four years. And that, I think those five years in military school really helped me to learn the ropes of the military mm -hmm. and to become a survivor, or at least build the foundation to be a survivor. Okay. Now, and in these military schools, and especially at, at, at Marmy, and what kinds of, of, of military practice or whatever or, or training do you get in okay. that context? This is 24 hours military. I mean, you slept in dorms. Uh, you got up at a certain time every day. You had uh, uh, morning inspection and formations. Uh, before class, and then of course you're still in a military regimen and through classes. Um, most of the classes were college prep, mm -hmm. the usual for that, plus the military or the junior R R or the ROTC uh, classes, map reading, drill and ceremonies, um, map reading, mm -hmm. uh, just anything that would be of the junior or the ROTC uh, format. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, like I say, I learned a lot from that, too, so I knew how to read a map and all the other allied uh, stuff. Okay. Uh, and so then when did you graduate from there? That would have been June of 64. Okay. And what did you do once you graduated? I uh, went back home to Muskegon and went to Muskegon Community College for a year. Uh, had way too much fun. And then in July of 65, that's when LBJ uh, what I call rattled the sabers mm -hmm. and had his speech that they're going to uh, involve us in Vietnam and uh, I thought about my grades and the fact I wasn't married or had you know nothing so basically I was uh, a prime candidate for the draft mm -hmm. so I figured okay let's uh, be proactive here if you get drafted this is what I'm thinking mm -hmm. if you get drafted you go to Vietnam however if I enlist with all my previous knowledge, I should be just fine. So I enlisted uh, the end of August of 65. And, and now did the, the calculation of being just fine include the prospect of, of going to Vietnam? No. Okay, you thought you could just be valuable enough they'd put you someplace else? Right, because I was going into communications. Okay. And, uh, and a sort of a humorous aside to this is the fact that I enlisted and ended up in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Now my good friend from Muskegon got drafted. He ended up at Fort Hood, Texas for two years. Now I think that's a little ironic, if you will. Mm -hmm. And we still laugh about it to this day. 
Oh, you know, they need good people in Vietnam. That's so, a good way to put it. Yeah. Well, well, at the time you went in, too, they are building units and putting them together, and they mm -hmm. need people of all specializations, and they were clearing them out of units in Germany and mm -hmm. elsewhere to fill them out. Mm -hmm. so, so you just stepped in at, at the right time. I think uh, really everybody did. All right. Now, aside from the LBJ speech, and I guess American ground troops, Marines went in in March of 65, and the Army was going in as about as early as May. Mm -hmm. But by July, okay, this is getting big, and, and you start to get the really big draft groups in after that. Okay. How, what else did you know about Vietnam or what was going on over there? Not a whole heck of a lot, uh, like most people at that time. Um, I just knew that there was uh, combat going on mm -hmm. and uh, troops were getting killed, wounded, and uh, in my way of thinking, survival over there um, was probably not good. Uh, when I was in basic training at Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri, uh, and I may be jumping ahead here, uh, a major brought me into his office having known my background, and he insisted I was going to officer candidate school. Mm -hmm. And I said no. And a discussion ensued, mm -hmm. but I won. I said, I'm not, no, I don't want to be an officer because you go in as a second lieutenant and a first lieutenant, and you're usually pl platoon leaders. Mm -hmm. Basically, you just have a target on your back. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping to uh, improve my statistics by not being an officer. <laughs> Well, at that point, you only had a year of college. I mean, you were right. would not have been quite as old as most of the guys doing the OCS and the rest of it, too. Yeah, when I went over, I was um, 19 or 20. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, when you go and you enlist, at some point they have you do the, the Army physical. Uh, where mm -hmm. did they do that? That was at Fort Wayne in Detroit. Okay. And can you describe a little bit the scene there when you go through that? Well. From what I can remember, because they rush you through this, is you have the standard physical, and they give you some little tests, and they have you uh, open your mouth and say, ah, check your eyes, and all that, and make sure that you're physically fit for the military. And uh, I think that was like two days, but I mean, it just, all I remember is going in with paperwork. I remember standing in line to get some shots and physicals, and standing in a room with a bunch of other guys and proudly standing at attention and raising my right hand and said, I faithfully will rec or represent my country right. in so uh, many words. Now, later on, at least, you get a lot of stories about you know, guys going to the physical and trying to find ways to beat the system or scam it or that kind of thing. Were you observing anything like that at that time? I guess I really wasn't. I was just sort of concentrating on me, wondering, what have right. I gotten myself into? Mm -hmm. All right. Because my life didn't belong to me anymore. It belonged to the government. Right. Okay. So they send you down to, to Leonard Wood in Missouri for, for basic training. And mm -hmm. can you describe what happened there? Uh, I went there, let's see, shortly after I enlisted in August of 65 and got assigned to a training company and went through everything, basic, the basics uh, of some what I had in military mm -hmm. academy. But uh, there was also uh, live fire, uh, marksmanship, uh, live grenade throwing, uh, bayonet training, uh, obstacle course, which was uh, interesting, uh, barbed wire and live fire, allegedly, and crawling through mud. Um, I was somewhat fortunate. I don't know why some of these things fell into my lap. but. We were in old wor World War II barracks, mm -hmm. which were heated by coal furnaces. And I got to be what's known as a fireman, which means instead of going out and training, you would stay in the company area, go around and make sure the furnaces are running and put coal in there and just basically smell like coal for that entire day. So I didn't have to go on uh, the training situation, but since I'd already been through this stuff in military mm -hmm. academy, I really wasn't missing anything. Mm -hmm. The emphasis was really put on killing, killing, and I, I, I realize that's part of survival, but uh, that's not really something that uh, someone in their late teens really uh, would think they'd ever be in a situation of doing. So that was uh, somewhat eye-opening. 
Right. Now, of course, you're talking about stoke and coal furnaces. You, you get there in August. So, mm -hmm. so you, you need furnaces at night? Um, it get, gets cool in Missouri at night. Yeah. And, and you're, that's, that's kind of in the hill country, too, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's out there near the uh, Appalachians. Or Ozarks. Ozarks. Or, yeah. There we go. I was yeah. close. They're both mountains. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Middle school geography, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. And then that, that's sort of, is that about an eight-week course or? I bol it was eight to 12 weeks. All I know is I finished up in November. Okay. Uh, that may have been total more, more like 12 because they varied how, actually that, that, that early they may well have been longer. They varied the length of training at different times mm -hmm. in the war. So I asked that question just to find out and I never should guess and give a number. Okay. You I can't remember. It's been but, but that so goes, long. But that's long. November, and then you get an AIT after that, right? Yep. Went to Fort Devens, Massachusetts for uh, radio training, cryptology, and learned a lot there. The Military Occupational Specialty, or MOS, uh, was uh, Morse code interceptor, which basically means you have headphones on, you have a typewriter, you're listening to beeps, monotony, for eight hours and typing what you hear. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't really think that would be very exciting, so I deliberately decided, well, I'm just going to slow down, so I washed out, which was fine with me. At that point, um, you don't know what they're going to do with you, because now you're at their mercy. Fortunately, they kept me in communications. Mm -hmm. Now, let me tell you about my stint at Fort Devens. Uh, that's outside of Boston. So I had a couple opportunities to go into town, and I learned to park my car and go to get a beer. <laughs> but that was very nice. That's the only time I had been in Boston. And uh, I remember this great bar with great beer and great sandwiches. But yes, when I got to Fort Devens, that would have been in November. And then, of course, around that time, it started snowing. Mm -hmm. In Massachusetts, you get a bit of snow. Yep. But while I was there, I met this uh, one guy, Dean Owen, uh, also from, uh, well, no, he's from Maryland. So we struck up an acquaintance. So when I washed out, uh, they sent me to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, again, mm -hmm. uh, and assigned me to a radio unit, uh, a fixed station, in other words, brick and mortar type mm -hmm. thing, not out in the field. And I was there, and I was really enjoying that until um, one day I got orders for Vietnam, which I started uh, wondering, oh, hmm, what's going to become of this? Okay, could you just talk a little bit about the the, the, the stint there, at Leonard Wood? How long were you there before you got the orders for Vietnam? Let's see, I got there, I believe, like in February of '66. Yep. Yeah and got orders uh, to go to Fort Riley, Kansas for the 9th Division uh, in June. Okay. So it was a very short uh, assignment. Okay. Now, what can you describe a little bit of the, the nature or kind of radio equipment you were working with at Leonard Wood while you were there? Uh, this is the large communication between uh, bases, military communications, large transmitters, and radio, something like you have here mm -hmm. in the studio, but all radio based. Okay. And just uh, making sure everything's tuned and everything's working the way it should and adjusting the frequencies. Mm -hmm. So you're operating it, you're not necessarily repairing it or? No. Okay. No, just making sure everything's operating according to spec. All right. So you do that briefly. Okay. Now you go to Fort Riley. Fort Riley, now uh, you're joining the 9th Division. Can you right. explain what's going on with them at that time? Sure. Uh, they started forming the division back in February of 66, and I got there in June, so it wasn't too long after it started forming. And I was assigned to headquarters company of the 15th Engineer, 15th Combat Engineer Battalion. Mm -hmm. And they were bringing people from all over. And uh, I was in the communications section of headquarters company for the uh, battalion. Uh, allied to that, who should appear but Dean Owen. Um, so we were in the same unit. And uh, then another guy joined us, uh, Bob Whiteside uh, from Chicago. And I know the three of us just hit it off. Mm -hmm. And we were sort of the three musketeers, if you will. So we were forming the battalion 
uh, and the division and training as a unit to get bonded and familiar with ICE with everything and training specifically for uh, our jobs in Vietnam. And since it was a combat engineer battalion, I kind of figured that uh, my tour would be interesting. <laughs> so we trained, got everything done, uh, loaded up, prepared our vehicles, loaded them up on the train, and uh, that left the beginning of October of 66 uh, cross country to Oakland in California. And they were shipped over to Vietnam ahead of us. They, we were given, uh, well, I'm going to stop there and backtrack mm -hmm. about Fort Riley. Mm -hmm. um, it was a very interesting location because it's located between Manhattan, Kansas, and Junction City, Kansas. And they were great towns we had a chance to go with because a bus would go from one town to the, uh, to mm -hmm. the other through the base. Mm -hmm. So we were able to just catch the bus to go to either one. And I remember the PX there had great pizza and great dark beer. Mm -hmm. All these wonderful things that happened to center around food and beer yep. maybe. And uh, we really bonded there. Uh, some of the interesting things um, at Fort Riley is that we were, we went out in the field, practice uh, uh, assignments. And I remember this one time it was cold and rainy. And here we are training for Vietnam in cold and rain. Well, there was one thing in common, the rain. Mm -hmm. But the cold uh, wasn't uh, very conducive to Vietnam type jungle training. And let me back step a bit because mm -hmm. I meant to talk about when I was at Fort Devens, Massachusetts. Now I'm there in winter and they were also training some of the guys from Vietnam. So um, here they are in Fort Devens, Massachusetts training people specifically for service in Vietnam and they had hooches and the aggressor force wearing the pointy hats. In the middle of winter you're wearing winter outfits the Mickey Mouse boots, as they're called, and in winter you're training for Vietnam. I just thought that was somewhat mm -hmm. ironic, too. No. Yeah. Okay. Now, with the the Ninth Division, with the unit that you're now in, uh, within within the Engineer Battalion, did you have a lot of sort of more senior enlisted men, guys who'd been in the Army for longer periods? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, they brought them from all over to fill the appropriate slots. Um, as far as those with combat experience in Vietnam, it was a rarity. It was. There it might have been a few who had been in Korea, maybe? Yeah, I would say so, yeah. But uh, because, what, 15, 20 years maybe had gone by that the majority of them have really uh, had no combat experience right. at all. So right. we were all basically green troops. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now. The, your, your equipment get goes, will get shipped over by boat. How did you get to Vietnam? Well, our unit, the engineer battalion, uh, went over by boat. And we were the advance party for the division. So mm -hmm. we got there in October to build up the base camp that they were going to be assigned to. And uh, so we just went in with all the equipment and okay, uh, so, so were you on the ships that were carrying the equipment or did no they? no okay. that because they were way ahead of us all about right. a week and a half two weeks so they were there when we got there but the boat trip over um, <laughs> it's far from a cruise uh, down to brass tacks yes it's a cruise but it's an entirely different atmosphere and uh, that's where a lot of the training for our mindset took place. Um, they really brought us down to the basics, that it's you versus them. And it got to the point where, in my mind, I can't talk about anybody else, but where I got to believe that the Vietnamese were subhuman. That's all part of what they did that mm -hmm. I learned. And. Uh, I just, I really had no respect for them. And that's truly sad in retrospect. Now, would that apply to all of them, whether they were yep. supposed to be on our side or not? Yep. Okay. And, and who's giving this to you? Uh, the NCOs, a few of the officers. Mm -hmm. but, uh, we did have a bunch of free time, uh, but we also did PT and other things and um, 
cleaned our weapons. What was the weather like on the way over? It wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. Uh, since I was going to Vietnam, I got a camera, and I got some great uh, sunsets and sunrises on mm -hmm. the Pacific. So that was uh, interesting. One notable thing about the trip over, um, that you're fed on the ship, and it's 18 days from mm -hmm. California to Vietnam. So there really wasn't a whole lot of fresh milk, so you uh, were served powdered milk. <clears throat> That's an experience in itself. That was uh, interesting. So we're on the boat going over. We were with uh, a company of Marines as well. So they were in other part of the, the uh, ship because uh, all servicemen are of the same, but there's, I won't say necessarily a rivalry, but you know, that inter uh, agency mm -hmm. service uh, camaraderie, you know, they just mm -hmm. call people different names, it, all in good humor. So they were at one end of the ship and we were at the front of the ship, the bow mm -hmm. and the stern. Even an army guy knows some nautical terms. And we took liberty in Okinawa. Now this I'm not necessarily proud of, but I remember buddying up and getting off the ship. And we made the rounds, and I woke up back on the ship. Now how I got there, I have no clue. I don't remember. So mm -hmm. that tells me I guess I had a good time. Probably. Yeah. And I wasn't really a, a drinker. I mean, I had beer, but not a whole lot. So this was my uh, first experience in uh, heavy alcoholic sedation, if you will. Mm -hmm. I tried to look at it humorously. Well, I've interviewed an officer or two who had to be in charge of guys who stopped off in o o Okinawa, and your account kind of fits in with his. <laughs> so, not right. necessarily proud of it. So that was a day liberty, and then from there we went to Da Nang by mm -hmm. ship, and offloaded the, the Marines to do what they have to do. And then we went down south to Vung Tau, which is an in-country R&R &R center. But here we are on the ship. They're bringing these uh, barges to the ship and we get off. Now we had our weapons. Mm -hmm. Oh good, that's, that's all well and good. And we went by barge, not too far to land. We were then trucked out to this airstrip, waiting for planes to bring us in further to where we were going to be. So here we are for several hours sitting alongside an airstrip, all newbies, if you will, in country, looking around, wondering, you know, what's going to happen with no ammunition. Mm -hmm. We were slightly nervous. I mean, we didn't know where we were and what the situation was there conflict-wise, but that was really weird. We got on the caribous, were uh, flown into Bearcat, and that's outside the town of Long Time. There was a special forces camp outside with a little airstrip. And then our, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> our base, which was, was a very small base at the time, and it was uh, a, a contingent of the 4th Infantry Division was there. And it was uh, Camp Martin Cox for the, um, one of the early casualties of the war. And we built up that base camp maybe ten times the size it was. But uh, so we were still had no ammunition and we were there in the base. And were the fourth division guys providing security at this point? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. So we were attached to the fourth division at that time for, I don't know, a couple weeks or so, I guess. And then we were attached to the eighteenth engineering brigade because you have to be attached to a parent unit. Mm -hmm. And so we were attached to them. So I basically got uh, the right to wear the 4th Division combat patch, the 18th Engineering Brigade uh, combat patch. So we were there uh, from mid-October to mid-December, and that's when the rest of the division came in. And I was on a convoy out as they're coming in, and uh, not that I'm a veteran in country, but uh, I knew two months more, more information and, than they did. So it was kind of funny as they're coming by in these deuce and a half, and I'm just sitting there and just sort of smiling, thinking, you have no clue what you're in for. 
Okay. And how much, uh, what have you learned over the course of those two months? Uh, to protect my butt. Um, maybe three weeks into that, uh, of course, we were, we got there, and it was just the start of the monsoon season, so the ground was not at all stable. Mm -hmm. It was basically mud and puddles and water, and we set our cots up inside of this with a tent that was just put up, and we had our foot lockers that were sitting on the mud, mm -hmm. and it was not, you know, you get up in the morning, you have your nice floor, you put your feet on, carpeted or heated and all that, where you basically sat in your cot, put your boots on, then you stood up. Mm -hmm. But that was interesting. Anyway, back to the three weeks after, or, uh, so I was there, uh, you're filling sandbags all the time. If you have nothing else to do, you fill sandbags. Well, I basically call them mud bags, because that's what it was like. And it was after dinner, it was probably about eight o'clock at night, and we're out there filling sandbags, and we hear this distant boom. And as we all look up, we see in the distance this great fireball rising into the sky, and just, you know, the mushroom type thing. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, what happened? What's going on? Got very nervous. And I thought to myself, I still have more than a, well, almost a year left here. And this is what greets me after mm -hmm. a couple of weeks. So that was very traumatic because, I mean, it really struck home that you were there. Mm -hmm. By that time, they'd finally issued us some ammunition. Not a whole lot, but just. Now, were you still carrying M14s at this time? Or did yes, you? we went over with M14s. Now, uh, in military academy, we had M1s, mm -hmm. so I knew an M1 inside and out, and of course by this time I knew my M14 inside and out. By the way, the M1 is an excellent weapon, just too big and not mm -hmm. enough ammunition. So we had the M14s, which we were constantly cleaning, and uh, we were communicating with uh, the different companies of the battalion uh, as they are building things up. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I think they did some preliminary engineering type patrols, but it, the, the main assignment was building the base camp, the roads, the streets, the uh, unit areas, mm -hmm. and just expanding it. That was the primary thing to do while we were there in advance of the division. And were you building an area for your own battalion? Oh, yes. Okay. Because oh, yes. you, you, you talk about being sort of heading out as the other guys are coming in, but they weren't transferring you necessarily no, somewhere. No, we, we built up our area, and that's where we stayed, and we had gotten all the other areas ready for the rest of the division. Now, when you're building a, your company area or, or whatever, a battalion area, are you doing things now to physically improve it to get yourself out of the mud, or are you still... Right, yes. You're, you're building it so there's proper drainage, and uh, it is in a organized fashion. You would expect that, nothing less from the military. And you had your orderly room, which is the administration center. You have the officers' quarters, their nice little tents. And then you have all of us minions in our group tents. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would build wooden platforms to put the tents right. on. Right. And then you had to fill the mud bags around them and dig uh, a mortar trench with uh, cover. Had to do that for all the base. Um, a mortar trench with cover, does that take protection against mortar attacks? Right, yeah. right. Although I don't necessarily think they would have been all that great. Right. Fortunately, when we were there, we didn't get too much of that initially. But the larger the base got and the more personnel we got, it became more of a target. So that would happen once in a while. Of course, we'd have drills. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's basically what we had to do to prepare for the division arriving. Okay. After they arrived and normal military operations ensued, uh, the units would go out into the field with uh, the appropriate uh, infantry units for support. One of the major things that we were tasked with is clearing the jungle. Uh, away from the roads, mm -hmm. and that was done two ways. One, by the infamous Agent Orange, which affected all of us, even though they said, oh, this is not going to hurt you, you know, it's, it's just for bugs and mm -hmm. to defoliate. No, th nothing to worry about. That's another story. But we had these bulldozers, 
with these big old blades that were sharp. And every night after they'd come back in or wherever they are, they'd actually grind the, those things down to, to a razor edge. Mm -hmm. So all they'd do is take the bulldozers and just go in slowly. And it was so sharp, it would actually cut down the trees. And some of the bigger ones, they used chainsaws. But okay. now are these bulldozers, are these uh, the ones they call Rome plows? Or? Yes, okay. Rome plows. Yep, exactly. And they would clear it back anywhere from 50 or more yards away from the road, so they didn't have anything to conceal themselves in. Okay. Now, what was the, the terrain generally like? Was it fairly flat in the area you were operating in? It was mostly flat with uh, some hills and some mountains, depending on where you go mm -hmm. in the country. Right. Um, and I have to say this about Vietnam. It's a beautiful country. I mean, rich, lush greens, blue skies when it wasn't raining, mm -hmm. um, red and brown earth. It was just a contrast of colors uh, six months out of the year. Of course, when it's dry, you have to contend with the humidity, uh, not so much in the dry season, but the heat and the dust. So you really never got clean in the dry season. Mm -hmm. Now, opposed to that, you have the rainy season or the monsoon season. I was fortunate to uh, enjoy that for twice, mm -hmm. but nothing got dry. I mean, your uniforms, even though they were washed, by the Vietnamese laundry, uh, they really not, they did not get dry and they would stick to you and it's a very uncomfortable feeling. And since we're talking about the weather, I remember this one time uh, in the morning when we got up and formed for our company form formation, uh, it was so cold we had to put our field jackets on. It had gotten down to the freezing temperature of 70 because you're acclimated to like 110 mm -hmm. degrees. So, I mean, that was, never thought I'd ever shiver in Vietnam, but right. there, were that, there was that occasion. So how long does it take to get, to get physically acclimated there? Because there's the, there's the climate and the um, food or whatever else you've got. Uh, I would say by the time the division came into December, I was, we were pretty well there. Yeah. And uh, right now, compared to where I was in Vietnam, I'm physically now twice the man I was. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe that's exaggerating slightly, but uh, I really got skinny. All right. Now you were on, on a regular base. You'd have kind of a standard army food, and not you're not just living off of sea rations or whatever. Yeah. Uh, right. Not until we were out in the field. Right. And they'd rotate us so that we would be in base camp, out in the field, just like anything, but at uh, a more not on a regular schedule like the infantry was, mm -hmm. just as needed. Right. Okay. Now you're in communications, so you spent a lot of time in, in the larger base, but they're also sending you out in the field now? Right. To support the uh, engineering units. Okay. Uh, mostly the uh, bridge building and the jungle clearing uh, and road building. Those were the big tasks, plus, you know, the construction on the base camp, which was always ongoing. Mm -hmm. By the time I left Vietnam, 18 months later, it was a, I would say, a pretty fair-sized city, if you will. Okay. And then at some point, so so Bearcat is up kind of east of Saigon, basically. Uh yes. Yeah. Yeah, about uh, 20 miles, yeah. roughly. Yeah. Not too much. There's a lot of different American bases kind of around in that area, and you're one of them. And then the Ninth Division, in part, is moving, is also operating down toward into the Delta region. In the Delta and around Saigon area. Mm -hmm. Um, we were in Vietnam, let's see, on, at Bearcat until about maybe January, February of 68 when the battalion was tasked to go down to the Delta to Dong Tom mm -hmm. and build up this base. And we're in the Delta and we're on the Mekong River. So they brought, the, brought these big dredges in to dredge the sand from the river to put it on land to build mm -hmm. this camp, all sand, from virtually nothing. Yeah. But uh, Bearcat, um, it did expand where we actually had a swimming pool, a library, 
much bigger PX, uh, an average size hospital, uh, a little bit larger than a mass unit, uh, huge helicopter strips, and it was somewhat safe, mm -hmm. but it, uh, I won't say it was a choice assignment. It was interesting because you know that anything could happen at any time. So I was very fortunate, or blessed if you will, that I had this um, safe assignment. But I enjoyed it because I was basically uh, a communications person. Mm -hmm. And uh, that always intrigued me. From when I was a little tot, I wanted to be in radio. So here I am in combat radio, which is a whole different uh, I won't say lifestyle so much, but uh, operation, where it's all tactical communications. And you had to be able to discern what's being said from the units. You mm -hmm. had to have very, very sharp ears, so you'd have headphones on so you can differentiate what people are saying. And I learned that it's easier for me to understand what they're saying if I close my eyes as I'm taking messages, because then I could concentrate on that sense. But uh, being on the radio and hearing what's going out in the field, uh, you really feel blessed that uh, you're in a sort of a safe environment. Okay. Now, you're communicating specifically with the engineer units yes. that are out in the field. Yeah, the now, now the do companies. you also at times be listening in on the nets that the combat units were on, or was that separate from uh, That was entirely separate. We were assigned our own frequencies. Mm -hmm. And so we wouldn't necessarily hear that. I mean, we had a bunch of radios, so sometimes we'd surreptitiously tune to their ch channel mm -hmm. just to uh, hear what's going on. Okay. Now you get there, and so now you're you're there. It's in in, in '67, and uh, the there's a fair amount of stuff going on. I mean, how much sort of how close do the engineers get to a actual combat, or how much oh. how much trouble do they get into out there? Oh, they're right out there. Um, they have their own weapons and uh, would get ambushed or sniped at um, because to the Viet Cong and the NVA, you were soldiers and you're coming to, you have invaded their country, mm -hmm. so they want to defend it. So, you know, it's not unusual that they'd be building a bridge and get ambushed and they'd have to perform infantry uh, duties to protect themselves and the projects they're working on. Mm -hmm. the, the Rome plows we mentioned earlier were somewhat armored, but also had these heavy duty cages around them. So if something falls on the dozer, they don't get hurt, mm -hmm. but ho they're not necessarily protected from hand grenades or rockets or mortars, but somewhat armored. And, and were the Rome plows targets? Oh yes, oh yes, as were the bridge uh, uh, builders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the rest of it um, was just building stuff, but the Rome Plows and the bridge companies, or company was, uh, uh, they were definitely targets. Okay, and do you have a sense of what kind of casualties they took? When I was over there, I didn't really concentrate on that. I was just concentrating on saving my butt mm -hmm. and keeping myself alive and making it home. Uh, so there were, there were many of them, and uh, I, I really can't say uh, okay. the various statistics. All right. Now, if I can go back to the mm -hmm. three musketeers I yep. mentioned. Uh, so there was myself and Dean Owen and Bob Whiteside, and we were assigned to the same company, the same communications section. So consequently, you're working together and you build up this bond. Mm -hmm. Why it was the three of us, I don't know. And uh, so the three of us, sort of helped each other and uh, became very, very close buddies. All right. Now, uh, you, did you get assignments out in the field as well? Uh, yes, uh, to support um, different uh, units. The one I remember specifically was the 173rd Airborne Brigade, um, where we were out there uh, communicating with our engineering detachments there, um, and we were this one time, we were out in the middle of this area. It was alongside a creek. We had 
jungle forest on one side and plains on the other, and you're in a perimeter with tanks and uh, armored personnel carriers mm -hmm. around you. Now, communications, you would think, would be a very uh, secure thing. No, they put us on the side of the uh, creek, and we were on the perimeter. And you wonder, why would you put us here? We're supposed to be in the middle. <laughs> and of course, we had communications around the clock. And this one time, I was pulling the overnight shift, midnight to 8. And I'm sitting there, and your senses are very high-tuned. And i thinking, I hear something. So I turned off the light in the back of the truck. I slowly and quietly got out of the truck and looked over across the creek. And I stared and I stared and I thought I saw something. So I very slowly but quickly got back in the truck and just sort of hunkered down. And that bothered, that kept me awake the rest mm -hmm. of the shift. In the morning when it was over, I went and looked over there and it nothing changed, so I was seeing, mm -hmm. if you will, or uh, visualizing that there was some V.C. there, which was scary. Um, it was exciting because uh, they would test the weapons at night on the berm, mm -hmm. uh, the perimeter, and you'd have that going on. Uh, we did have also part of the engineering uh, battalion, uh, APCs that had flamethrowing capability. Now that's a sight as they spew this napalm over into an area. And uh, that was good to be behind that. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to be in front of it. But still, that was all in communication with our units, as well as having some communication with the unit you're deta or attached to. Not a whole lot, but they'll want to know, well, where's this unit? Can we have them come here so we'd coordinate that? Right. Now, when you were out in, in the field like that and you got a communication set up, would you have big old antennas sticking up? Or? Yes. Oh, look, there's a target. Mm -hmm. There's a radio unit. Yeah, we'd have to put these portable antennas up. They were probably like uh, maybe 15 to 20 feet mm -hmm. above where we were. But it was, well, I know that the, uh, the smaller radios, the ones they took out in the field that the RTOs took out, those, uh, they either would shorten the antennas or curl bend them, them over. To, yeah, yeah, bend them over to make them as inconspicuous as possible. Yeah, because they were the primary target of mm -hmm. snipers and ambush. And those were the, I still remember this, ANPRC 25s. Mm -hmm. And a uh, little backpack with the antenna. So that was interesting. I didn't have to hump any of those because we had the larger mm -hmm. radio equipment. Now, when you moved around, did you normally go by truck? Yes. Uh, there were times I went by helicopter. Oh, that was a real thrill. I mean, you're going at 150 miles an hour treetop level, mm -hmm. and these things are just whizzing by you. Um, and of course you think, okay, well, we're low to the ground, and uh, of course they're low to the ground because you really can't target those yep. well, but uh, you always have that in the back of your mind, okay. But yeah, I, I had a chance to ride, uh, of course, the caribous, which tri uh, shipped us in country, uh, the Hueys, the Bs and the Ds, the series. Uh, the Chinooks. Mm -hmm. If you're one of those like to ride in a washing machine, that's what a Chinook is like and loud. Um, I did not get a chance to ride in a loach, the very small observation yep. helicopters, right. nor the uh, uh, planes that the uh, forward air controllers would use. Mm -hmm. But that was the extent of, uh, I love flying. And I really got a chance to do that. Not as often as the, uh, the grunts did. But uh, there were, yeah, uh, most of the stuff, not just us, but of the division, uh, wasn't as necessarily airborne as the first CAV was, mm -hmm. but we did have uh, airborne units attached to us that would take uh, units out. And since we weren't an airmobile unit like the first CAV, we would also go out by vehicles. Mm -hmm. And then when you got down in, into the Delta and Dong Tam, I mean, they had uh, a couple battalions sort of actually based on barges in the yes. middle of the river yep, and they, they used landing craft to move around. Exactly. And there were ships out there, uh, barracks ships if you will, that uh, 
some of the infantry brigades were headquartered mm -hmm. on with the uh, PBRs, the patrol boat riverines, right. like not as PT boats, but mm -hmm. similar to it, right. much faster. And uh, those were the units that really drew fire. Uh, did not get a chance to ride in one, never went over the barrack ship, but we supported uh, the units with their um, radios as needed. Uh, most units had their communication sections that mm -hmm. did that, as did we. But yeah, Dong Tam was really dusty because it's sand mm -hmm. opposite at Bearcat where it's basically uh, in the rainy season all mud. In the rainy season at Dong Tam, there was some mud, but since it was sand, it would all filter down. Mm -hmm. So it was somewhat of a stable environment. And there, they actually built two-story wooden barracks. I, and I still can't wrap my head around the fact that we had two-story wooden barracks like dorms mm -hmm. down there. It just so how much incoming fire did these bases take? Well, when we moved down to Dong Tom, it was not unusual to have it, you know, every few nights or every night. And that's where I really increased my athletic ability to run. Because by that time, I was going to be, April was my uh, estimated ship out date. So I'm, what, four months away, so I'm getting what they know, uh, know as short. And uh, we built these big old rocket uh, shelters that were basically these Connex containers. And then you built sandbags around. The, there were sandbags there, not mud mm -hmm. bags yeah. like at Bearcat. So they were quite uh, elaborate. And the first few nights, we slept, uh, slept in tents. And about the third time that this happened, uh, I made the decision, I don't care about anybody else. I'm not sleeping in a tent at night. So I just stayed in the shelter mm -hmm. because I was gonna make it home. And running from the tent to the shelter, it was like you're definitely taking your life into your own hands because you don't know where things are coming from, mm -hmm. where they're gonna land. So that was probably <coughs> one of the more intense, scarier moments of my uh, mm -hmm. service in Vietnam. I was scared. Now, would the now did um, whether at, at Bearcat or at Dong Tam, was, as far as you could tell, was the incoming fire uh, at, at all controlled, or were they just kind of random shots lobbed into the perimeter? <coughs> A bit of both. Um, let me stop here and backtrack again. Okay. I was at Bearcat for Tet of '68, mm -hmm. uh, which was interesting. Before Tet, as I mentioned, the Vietnamese laundry, and there was mm -hmm. also a barber shop, and there would just happen to be one of those franchises, if you will, mm -hmm. across the street from our company area. So we get our haircuts there, our laundry, and all that. And then you have the straight razors and all to shave us. After Tet, they never came back. We never saw them again, mm -hmm. which made me think that, okay, while they're in the base, because there's several of them all around, mm -hmm. they're actually plotting where things were. And uh, how easy would it have been for them before Tet to take us out since they're using straight lit razors? Okay, now my imagination's running mm -hmm. wild, but you just, you think about all these things. But they never came back and we sort of suspected that was the case. I know there were a lot of them, you know, were VC, and in some cases they got killed attacking bases and so forth, so that you couldn't come back. But well, friendly by day, enemy at night, yeah. because when we got rocketed, we send out patrols, mm -hmm. the division would, outside the uh, berm, and they'd always find Arvin units, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, mm -hmm. friendlies. Yeah. And you know there was no enemy around, but the Arvin troops were there. And I was going. Could it be? Because that's another thing. Uh, for the most part, we didn't have a whole, I didn't have a whole lot of respect for the Arvin units either because of this. And I still have that mindset that these people are subhuman. And I still regret that. Now, how much did you see of, of the civilian population? I mean, you've got some of it in the area we were operating and some of them work on your base. Well, yes. Um, and there was a town outside the base, which was off limits. Mm -hmm. 
um, there wasn't much to speak of anyway. Uh, I did get an in-country R&R back at Vung Tau, so we're actually in mm -hmm. a safe area. Um, so that was enjoyable. I got a chance to see uh, probably the lifestyle of them a bit, a bit more. Plus, we'd, the, we'd travel on, in convoys mm -hmm. to go to the different areas, and you'd travel. you can always smell when you're coming to a village because they use a sauce on the fish, nuk mom, if mm -hmm. I'm pronouncing it right, and that is very pungent, and you can tell. And you come to the, you drive through the marketplace, which is usually alongside the road, and here's all this stuff, fish and poultry and vegetables, all on sale. But that was so pungent, you could always spot a larger village with that. All right, okay. Uh, we were talking about you had gone back home and you were <coughs> kind of dealing with people at, at the time. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel a disconnect mm -hmm. with uh, my friends from growing up, but I didn't see much of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know why, and I don't know if it was of my choosing or the opportunity didn't present itself. I don't know, because I was just concentrating on enjoying life mm -hmm. out of a very uh, serious situation. And uh, I was going to Chicago on weekends to be with this young lady who I had been introduced to by Bob Whiteside from Chicago. And so that was occupying my uh, weekends while I was home. But uh, it was nice being with the family um, and just close to being totally a civilian, right. almost. Except you knew you were going back. Yes. Okay. So how did they get you back out there? Uh, we had to travel to uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey, mm -hmm. and they loaded us on an aircraft, and we flew from there to Anchorage, Alaska for refueling, and then over the Pacific to Tonsonut Air Base uh, in Saigon, and from there it was convoy back. Now, were they flying you in chartered civilian chartered, aircraft? Chartered, yes. Yep. Okay. I think one of them was Tiger Airlines. Mm -hmm. um, I. I and were you going over with just a miscellaneous group of replacements, as far yep. as you could tell? Yep, and people on leave that were going back over, too. So it was a mixed bag there. Mm -hmm. Didn't talk much because uh, you know where you were going. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when do you get back in country, then? When did you get back? Let's see. That, I'm going to think now. So Probably December of 67. Yeah. Uh, or a little bit before that. Mm -hmm. No, wait a minute. I gotta think because it was okay, summer. So where, where were you at Christmas? All, all my Christmases were in Vietnam. Yeah, two okay. of them, which I got to see Bob Hope and Raquel Welch. But uh, so it must have been not December of '67. Must have been like August of '67. So you yeah, had, so was. you got the leave before your full year had been up. Right. But, but the point when you decide to after extend, I extended, they, I was they, they, they eligible. And okay, that's, that's earlier that's when I did it. All right. Uh, yeah. So talk about Bob Hope. Well, Not a lot of the guys got a chance to see it over there, uh, being as I was uh, assigned at that point back to the base camp. Um, we knew he was coming, so everybody on base that wasn't on duty. Of course, we were all on duty, but that weren't in uh, serious tactical assignments. Uh, went to this area where the stage had been built up, and uh, they flew him in with Raquel Welch and a whole bunch of other uh, entertainers, along with Les Brown, the band of mm -hmm. renown. Um, and that was, I think, about an hour, maybe two-hour show. And that was quite a thrill to see Bob Ho. I mean, he had this reputation of always being there for the troops. Mm -hmm. And that was very nice to see what we called round eyes, mm -hmm. non-Asian uh, uh, gender folks. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took our mind off of the situation. It was funny and enjoyable. Uh, I had the foresight to purchase a, a zoom lens from my camera. So even though I wasn't at the foot of the stage, the uh, zoom lens helped me get close. Get a good look at Raquel Welch. I got a good uh, look at her crocheted dress, yes. Not that I could see every uh, filament or fiber, but right. uh, enjoyable experience that it was. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Now, going back sort of the larger um, the, the sort of morale or attitude of the unit, uh, how did the guys, the, the new guys, when they came in, um, how well do they seem to have adjusted? How well did they well, perform? Well, they all were trepidatious. And being at that point where I was a non-commissioned officer, um, I had the responsibility of some people under me that I had to train, acclimate, uh, watch over, and protect, if you will, for them. And uh, you did that to some extent. Mm -hmm. You did your duty, right? but that's as far as it really went. Mm -hmm. And did they function or perform as well as the guys they replaced? I hadn't thought about that. Um, well, I will say at that point, probably not, because I'd been there for a full yeah. tour. And you grow into it, where these guys were new, right. so they weren't fully developed, so to speak. But that was your job to get them to that point. But if you'd compare them to yourselves at, the t at that stage in, in your tour, were they? They were FNGs. Mm -hmm. I'll let somebody else define that acronym. Yep. But basically, I mean, if you look back to when you started, were they working at about the same way you did, as far as you could tell? Somewhat. Okay. They, they still had to fine-tune their abilities, because mm -hmm. this is in a real tactical combat situation, mm -hmm. which you have no clue of what it's like until you're actually there. Yeah. How stressful could that get? I mean, if an if a engineer unit gets in trouble, and then they're calling back and so forth? Not as stressful as actually being in the combat yep. situation, but still stressful, because they're your guys in a situation, an ambush or mm -hmm. attack or whatever. So you have some concern for them, and it's your duty to be able to uh, answer their questions, relay the messages back from their questions and mm -hmm. whatnot. <coughs> Pardon me. Okay. Would you be in a situation where you'd have to call in support for them or? You just uh, no, okay. that was usually the artillery. Right. Uh, the only support was logistical mm -hmm. and um, any requests for them going to be returned to their infantry right. level training. Okay. All right. And another uh, issue that comes up a lot with Vietnam gets into the area of drug use. I mean, you talk about people, you, they're using beer on the base, are they smoking yeah. pot on the base too? Or? Well, at that time, the big drug uh, scenario hadn't really developed. Right. When I was there, it mostly was the beer. Mm -hmm. I didn't see any drugs. Uh, it may have been going on, but I wasn't aware of any. It was after I left back in when, uh, maybe late 69, 70, mm -hmm. 71, where yeah. it was really high, I hear. Well, that was when heroin came in, yes. which, which changed things dramatically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I didn't see any uh, conflicts as far as that, nor did I see any uh, racial issues. Yeah, because that is the we other all stereotype. Equal. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was not an issue, okay. not at all. Now, would you have a lot of black or Hispanic guys in the communications unit? Uh, a couple. We, and that was about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was very diverse. And when you're in that type of situation, uh, there's no gender, racial, or anything concern because mm -hmm. you're there for them to protect you and you to protect them. Okay, because people often say that when they talk about the combat units in the field, it doesn't matter what color your, your, your skin is, you need each other. Yes. Uh, and then the guys in the field will sometimes say that, well, yeah, but there's, a, there's a, or other places, there's a contrast between that and what's going on in the base camps. Mm -hmm. Yes. But, uh, but within the base camp, um, you didn't really see a whole lot of issues between white and black Not, soldiers. Uh, as it developed later. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody congregated in their own particular group, mm -hmm. Uh, mixed or whatever, but uh, not all the discrimination, so to speak, uh, that it later had. Because this is where you're getting when the draft uh, requirements had been changed yep. to get any able-bodied mm -hmm. person. And when that started to be fulfilled, that's when the morale uh, dissipated and things got a little bit more tense. But I was not there for that. I didn't right. see it. it. Like I say, it could have been going on. But no, I, it was, I was blessed again. OK. Uh, now, you also mentioned that we, we've got the, this group of three guys who were together at the mm -hmm. whole time. Now, 
one of those men got killed? Was yes. That right? Dean got killed uh, April 6, 1968. Uh, we were attacked in the base camp. <clears throat> and uh, in the process of running for shelter, he got a direct hit. Now, at that time, Dean and I had switched assignments. I had get, been given the opportunity to be a communications sergeant for one of our engineer companies mm -hmm. with under the condition that if I didn't like it, I could opt out. So I did it for a bit. Uh, I didn't really like it. It wasn't as fulfilling as I had mm -hmm. with the, uh, the battalion headquarters assignment. So I switched and Dean took the assignment and uh, he was happy there and he was with a company of the 15th engineers at that time when he got hit. Consequently, survivor's guilt mm -hmm. is what has been on me for almost 50 years because I lost a buddy and it's just, it's uh, very difficult when you bond with somebody mm -hmm. that you lose someone that you love as a brother mm -hmm. and had been buddies with and uh, that was difficult. Uh, Bob had the, since we were, this was in April of 68 yeah. and I was like a couple weeks away right. from coming home anyway, the three of us were. And uh, they needed an escort to escort uh, Dean's remains home. And Bob uh, volunteered for that and uh, was his escort. Mm -hmm. And when they got back to the States, uh, they lost Dean's remains for a couple weeks. Bob was just, I found out this after the mm -hmm. fact, many, many years later. And Bob was just, you can imagine, Dean's father was a master sergeant in the Pentagon. Oh. So believe me, a lot of pressure was put down the line to find out where Dean was. And they found him. And I don't know why this happened, but I suspect uh, it was uh, his father's pressure. Dean was buried in Arlington. Mm -hmm. And in May, of this year, after over 45 years, I got a chance to get closure when I went to the wall for the first time and touched Dean's name, mm -hmm. which was an extremely emotional experience. And since he was buried at Arlington, I had a chance to go to his uh, grave and. Mm -hmm weep there and I got closure so that I'm thinking now April, every April 6th maybe it'll be different than what it has been. Mm -hmm. Now guys have anniversaries of different trauma right? and they deal with it and uh, it'll be interesting to see how I am next April when mm -hmm. uh, that yeah. comes up. Yeah. And now uh, to go to survey them, we've, got, we've kind of taken you here now sort of to, to the end of your tour. You look back across the rest of the time you spent in Vietnam. Are there other particular incidents, one of your series, that kind of stand out in your memory from your time over there? In March of 68, uh, when Martin Luther King was assassinated and mm -hmm. I was over there for that, yeah. that was shocking. I mean, we just were, were in awe and I, I just, What was the reaction on the base? I mean, did they, were, were they were shocked, disbelief. Mm -hmm. You know, um, this is when the um, racial rights was starting to gear up mm -hmm. and none of us had a problem with that. At least those of us who were from the North, you mm -hmm. know. Um, I don't remember any reaction from any of the guys that were from the South. I just remember mine as being in total awe and there was a lot of talk about it, disbelief and whatnot. And then <clears throat> you get back to reality quickly mm -hmm. to continue to do what you need to do. Did the black soldiers change at all in their attitude or behavior after um, that? They may have, but I don't recall. But you were also, you I was really short. I mean, long. I was ready yeah. to go home, yeah. so that's what I was concentrating on. Yeah. yeah, and then you got distracted pretty quickly. Yes, with uh, Dean dying yeah, and, yep, and so. so forth. So you got that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I guess the. 
another thing, I guess you talked about going, kind of going through Saigon and so forth. I mean, how was Saigon different from the areas that you were operating in otherwise? Well, that was sup supposedly a safe area, so we didn't, when we went through, it was all during the day. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were fortunate that we didn't have, I did not have any incidences in any convoy I was mm -hmm. on. Very hypervigilant, but uh, it was a lot of, you had APCs in the convoy and Jeeps with 50 calibers and good defense mm -hmm. throughout the, the convoy. I guess the danger for that was often mines or IEDs or things yep, like that. Exactly, booby traps. And mm -hmm. uh, our Jeeps had this uh, device in the front end, a steel uh, angle iron, it was angled at the top with a little notch in it. So that as you're traveling down the road, if they put any wires across the road, mm -hmm. nobody would get de decapitated. So this would cut the wire, in theory. Mm -hmm. But while you were driving around, nothing blew up? No. Okay. No. Right. No, I, I, I came back in one piece, so to speak. All right. Uh, did you ever get kind of any? Uh, well, talk a little bit about. You said you had a brief time with one of the, uh, with, with a company. Were you still operating out of Dong Tam, or would you go? That was at Bearcat. That was Bearcat. Yeah, that okay. was just probably a few months short of us tr moving down to yeah. Dong Tam. Okay. Um, and I don't know what was that like, or what were you doing with a company that was different from the battalion? Well. Um, basically on a much smaller scale in charge of communications for the company, mm -hmm. for the different platoons and squads, uh, very localized in that aspect. Not as extensive or maybe responsible as it was at the battalion headquarters, mm -hmm. but it was on a much smaller scale. So just less interesting because it was smaller? Yeah. All right. Now, it was almost boring. A and that's basically the way combat is. It's a few minutes of chaos mm -hmm. with hours of monotony. Right. Yeah, and, and so the, the, the movie versions give you the lots of the chaos and, and leave out the rest because no one would sit through it. Yeah. yeah. And speaking of movies, if I can digress for sure. a moment, probably of all the movies I saw, Platoon is the one that really hit me. Not Apocalypse Now, mm -hmm. but Platoon. And where it really hit me is at the end when the guy is in the helicopter lifting off from the base, and he has a single guy down there mm -hmm. um, watching him. And the musical theme at that time was adagio for strings. Yep, right. Every time I hear that music, I think of me leaving Vietnam mm -hmm. without Dean. And that's when the survivor guilt really mm -hmm. hit me hard. I came back. He didn't, mm -hmm. and I switched assignments, and because of that, yeah. it could have been me, and mm -hmm. I was thought, why shouldn't it be me? Dean had just gotten married, he had a child in the way. Me, I had just my sister and my mother and father. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You were, now, do you think the, the, the films, I mean, they, I, I guess with Platoon, part of what people say is some lot of just the, the physical act, aspects of it and certain other things like that strike them as fairly real. I mean, the, the plot is kind of strange or, or contrived. And the reason why the guy was down there on the ground in the movie is sort of totally different, tended not to happen uh, that way. But but the but Oliver Stone had been there. And yeah. So yeah. some aspects of that carry over and the rest of it's Oliver Stone. Yeah, and they always uh, dramatize a lot yeah. of situations. One of the movies in my mind and that was probably extremely accurate as to what it's like to be there was we were soldiers. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and that's one that pretty, pretty closely follows the actual historical narrative. And so that's yes. a little bit different in terms yep. of what it's doing. I've had the pleasure of meeting Joe Galloway a couple times. I have a book signed by him, or well, that book. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Now, you get to the end of the tour. So, so when do you, uh, now you, you come back to the States. Um, when do you get back? That would have been the middle of April of 68. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, that's when a lot of the anti-war sentiment was right. high. Mm -hmm. And uh, we landed in Oakland at about 2 in the morning outside of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And we turned in our 
jungle uniforms and got khakis and the dress greens and we're not officially told to keep our uniforms on but there was the undercurrent of communication say if you're smart when you get off base you put civvies on mm -hmm. so I never had the scenario of being called a baby killer mm -hmm. denigrated as a soldier um, spit upon yelled at I was very fortunate a lot of my buddies now did experience that. Well, when you went through the, you know, you land in Oakland sort of as a you know, wee hours of the morning, uh, you go over to San Francisco, the regular airport then to fly home, or you fly out of <sighs> Oakland or not remember? I, th I think I did, because I remember it was a commercial airliner mm -hmm. from California yeah. to Chicago right. and then to Muskegon. Mm -hmm. But once again, that's a blur. And do you recall uh, seeing any protesters in the airports? Um, vaguely. Mm -hmm. But I was just ecstatic that I was home and done with my tour. And speaking of that, getting on the plane at uh, Tansanut, mm -hmm. um, everybody got on the plane and very quiet. And they closed the door, still quiet. But the minute we lifted off from the ground, there was this uproar mm -hmm. of raucousness and cheering mm -hmm. and laughter. And it, it was one big party. Mm -hmm. And uh, that went on for several minutes, and then everybody sort of settled down and started talking about mm -hmm. stuff. And eventually, it, it got to the point where you just fall asleep. Right. This is an 18-hour flight. Yeah. yeah. All right. Now you get home, and then you get to leave home for a little bit. Right. Yeah, I got another 30-day leave, mm -hmm. and uh, I never talked about that I'd been in Vietnam. I didn't let anybody know I was a veteran. I just was acclimating myself back mm -hmm. to being back in the world and uh, that was uh, comforting but still knowing full well that there are people you know mm -hmm. still there and of course your hitch is not over yet no so what do you do then after that leave well they were going to send me to germany for the about a year i had left but i had the opportunity to uh, be assigned to Fort Sheridan, uh, north of Chicago. Cushy assignment. Mm -hmm. And that was the headquarters of the Fifth Army, which was basically the Midwest. Right. And I was in communications there, uh, the, the uh, Army Communications Center for the Fifth mm -hmm. Army headquarters. And uh, that was great because it was almost as of being a civilian because it's, you know, regular eight hour shift. Mm -hmm. And if you had the eight to four, you could then go into town, which many of us did. Uh, or if you had the four to midnight shift, then you could go into town, but it, you know you don't have yeah. anything. But if you had the midnight to eight shift, then you had the day mm -hmm. in Chicago. And it was, it wasn't exciting, if I can call it that, as it was in Vietnam mm -hmm. and I was the shift supervisor but there in where the unit or the building I was in there were just two of us mm -hmm. I was a shift supervisor and there was a radio operator and usually the midnight to eight shift there's nobody coming around so we would just relax mm -hmm. and and rest our eyelids very carefully and with great intensity on listening Okay. Now, were you there at the time of the Democratic Convention yes. in Chicago? Uh, now you're in the military and crazy stuff is going on in, in, in the city. How much of that gets back to Fort Sheridan? Fort Sheridan was on alert. Uh, the National Guard is what actually went in mm -hmm. there, but we were on alert and uh, we weren't activated for that, but we were on alert for possibly doing it when things started erupting. So that was educational, mm -hmm. seeing our political process take its normal course with a lot of emotion on the outside with, I would say, probably some righteous indignation. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. So 
So how did it you view all of that? How did you view the anti-war movement at that time? Or I was shocked. I thought, you know, I'm pulling my duty for my country. I'm serving my country. I was doing my job. And I can understand, of course, it's different now because now they support the troops and mm -hmm. don't support the war. Yeah. There they didn't support the war, and we were physical, tangible uh, evidence yeah. of that. So we were bearing the brunt of all this uh, disrespect mm -hmm. and hatred and all that. And when I got out of the service, I never told anybody I was a veteran. I probably mm -hmm. didn't do anything uh, to raise my visibility until after 911. But yeah, I. That was interesting. Okay. Of course, it was. I was much more relaxed because I knew I was going to be getting out of the service, mm -hmm. and I would have gotten out in August of '69. But once again, when you're in the military, you learn a lot of things, and mm -hmm. I discovered I could get out early to go back to college. So mm -hmm. I did. I got out in May instead of August. But that was a cushy assignment in Chicago. Um, you couldn't ask for a better assignment because you had an army headquarters, mm -hmm. and life there was yeah, food's better. <laughs> yep, yeah, everything was better. All right, and were there a lot of people that you saw or dealt with who'd been to Vietnam by then? Uh, a few. Uh, once again, at that point, uh, I was a combat veteran. Right. And uh, the people there, most of them weren't. The majority mm -hmm. of them weren't. So there was some awe, I guess mm -hmm. you could say, of me having been there. Right. Did people ask you about it? Other soldiers, yeah. 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 You know, what's it like? What can I expect? Mm -hmm. You know, what did you experience? Things like that. Because a lot of them kind of figured that uh, there would, they would have their turn. Mm -hmm. Of course, when I left, the buildup was just coming. Yeah, well, they've been building up at the biggest, yes. the large, but, but the forces got to their largest size, kind of late 68 into yep. the beginning of 69. Yep. Yeah. All right. Now, so the ones who did, so you leave then in, in May of <coughs> <coughs> okay. So you're out in May of 69. Uh, where do you go to school then? I went back to Muskegon Community College. Mm -hmm. And I was older than most students because by that time I was 22, 23 mm -hmm. and uh, you stood out because your deportment is different, mm -hmm. the haircut is obvious and uh, one of my teachers, the professors found out I was a Vietnam veteran so she asked me if I would do a class on Vietnam, not my experiences, mm -hmm. but the history of Vietnam and leading up to the war. <clears throat> so I did that, and after that, once again, there was that awe. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't buddy up with anybody in college, mm -hmm. uh, so I just, it was a commuter college like mm -hmm. it is in Grand Rapids, and when I was done the class, I went to work or home. But there was some awe like it was at Fort Sheridan of me having been there. Okay. Now what do you do after that? Well, like I say, I was in communications and from a we one, I always wanted to be in radio. So I mean real radio. Mm -hmm. So I got a part time job in radio broadcasting uh, in Muskegon and that would have been in sixty nine, seventy, and started doing part time work in radio disc jockey mm -hmm. and enjoyed it. It was fun. Uh, being a geek, I enjoyed all the equipment mm -hmm. as well and enjoyed it so much I thought, okay, well I want to get into this more and get more uh, job security in radio. So I went to get my first class radio telephone license for to be a broadcast mm -hmm. engineer, uh, which gets you more money and more responsibility. So I, I did that. and. Um, at that point, after I got home, <clears throat> being young and stupid, I thought, okay, let's see, what have I done in my life? I said, I've been in combat, I've done this, I've done that, the only other thing I have to do is get married. So I pursued that actively. 
uh, unfortunately. And uh, we'll just leave it at that. Okay. Uh, but then did you have a kind of career in radio ultimately? Or? Yes, I uh, was in radio for about eight years. And by that time, because I did a year at Muskingum Community College mm -hmm. and then I ended up moving to Grand Rapids to take a job in radio here. Uh, at one point, and it was in 73, that since I was news director at a local station here in Grand Rapids, uh, one of the school districts, the Wyoming Public Schools, was in the process of building up their communications mm -hmm. with the public. So I got offered the opportunity to be public relations for Wyoming Public Schools. And I thought, ah, this is a much better opportunity than getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning for minimal amount of uh, remuneration mm -hmm. where I could have, you know, a daily job, weekends off, and uh, be a person, so to speak. And I did that successfully for nearly 20 years and mm -hmm. enjoyed it immensely. All right. All right, then. So, um, I guess looking back over the whole thing, what in the end do you think you took out of your time in the service? Well, two things. On the positive side, I served my country, I did my duty, and uh, survived. Mm -hmm. And for many, many years, I just kept counting my blessings. I made it back mm -hmm. in one piece. I'm fine. I have no physical injuries or wounds. And it was about in uh, 97, 98, I started uh, encountering other veterans. Mm -hmm. And you can spot veterans very easily. And by that time, there was a lot of pride in having served in the military. Mm -hmm. So that's when the apparel, the coats, and the yeah. hats, <coughs> excuse me, uh, were appearing. So that's one obvious evidence that you were a veteran. So I encountered all these different veterans who were in Vietnam. And, you know, we, we chatted as you usually do. You welcome mm -hmm. them home. And they started asking me questions. So how was your service and all that, which mm -hmm. led up to the fact, have you been checked out for PTSD? I said, no, I'm fine. I mm -hmm. came back. I don't have any problems. Mm -hmm. And this happened for a dozen times at different times. Uh, and finally, I thought, maybe there's something to this. So I went to the vet center here mm -hmm. in town for combat veterans, mm -hmm. a readjustment center, and uh, went through some counseling sessions to see if I had it. And lo and behold, much to my amazement, I had the symptoms of PTSD. And I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And the more I got into it, the more I realized that all the things that I had done in my life, negative things, mm -hmm. was due to this. You just don't realize it. And there were many traumatic experiences that you just, okay, that you did that. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, um, I got into the system mm -hmm. and recognized the symptoms and the consequences of these. And so I am now in a group session and one-on-one -on -one counseling, and uh, it's made me much better of a person. The downside of that was that all the stuff I did, by the time I got married in 2001 to my third wife, um, I realized the mistakes I had made. Mm -hmm. This is before the diagnosis. Right. And I knew what I was not going to do, mm -hmm. the mistakes I had made. And so I got married, and back in the late, uh, well, like in 2009, 2008, when I started getting through this process, uh, with PTSD, usually it gets worse before it gets better. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, uh, my lovely bride uh, had to experience some of this turmoil, which created some tenseness, but um, it, it happens. Mm -hmm. It does. You, you have to 
go back to all the stuff you buried, right, and, and, and sort yeah. through that. Not as intense as some guys, mm -hmm. but yeah, we do. We don't talk necessarily about the trauma mm -hmm. in the group setting. Mm -hmm. It's more of educational and discussion with different aspects that each guy is having. Mm -hmm. we're, we're basically professionals in this right. uh, group, which has a f professional facilitator. And we talk about all things, current events, our experiences. There's a lot of uh, BS going on, but we do get down to the nitty gritty and talk about stuff and, and learn about the different symptoms and how to manage this mm -hmm. whole thing. Now, I want to stop here and say that PTSD is a diagnosis I got, post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. The trend now is to realize it's not a disorder, it's just an event. Mm -hmm. So they're going now to more to PTS, and it's not a disorder. But Vietnam veterans, there's a stereotype, mm -hmm. you know, the crazed killer that's going to walk into a building with an assault rifle mm -hmm. and just shoot everybody. Well, unfortunately, that's the bad side, you know, that's the, the, the generalization. And so one of the things that I, as well as the other guys, have become aware of is the fact that since we are Vietnam veterans and for, we're very much in the public eye, that we have to make sure we manage our triggers mm -hmm. and the symptoms so that we don't contribute to this negative stereotype. Because one of the things that happened to me is I developed this white hot temper that was right there. Mm -hmm. Right there, I was in somebody's face, which is inappropriate, and it creates a scene, and it contributes to that negative aspect. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's ultimately, it's the Vietnam guys who were the ones who kind of brought PTSD in, into the open, made the world and the VA and everyone else deal with it. Yes. And now you're in a distinctive position where you can actually provide a lot of support yes. to the guys these days coming back out of Iraq and yes. Afghanistan who experienced an awful lot of, of the same things and in certain ways are even more isolated from society than you guys were in that so few Americans now are even in the service. Right. Or in Congress, too, I might add. See, mm -hmm. I have the feeling that before you should serve in any elective office, you should serve two years in the military then you'll have a whole different perspective on what it's like to send people off to war. And yes, the Vietnam veterans, I'm proud to say, were probably uh, the forceful aspect of bringing treatment for PTS and Agent Orange to the forefront. Mm -hmm. And it really wasn't until after 9-1-1 where they started recognizing what we had done mm -hmm. and all that we had experienced there and as after effects. And we decided, as a group, not to let this ever happen again. Mm -hmm. And all of us are basically veteran advocates. I am. I'm not official. But if I encounter a veteran, you know, we chat and all that, mm -hmm. and ask them where they've been and what they did, and ask them, are you being treated? Are you in the system? And if you aren't, do you think you have? Mm -hmm. And you should really check it out. Because the VA never tells you this stuff. You just have to find it for yourself and it's all you it's on you now currently they're telling the guys this the guys and the gals mm -hmm. so that they're a little bit more aware than when we were when I got out I said yeah you're eligible for veterans benefits no no, no moving on to something mm -hmm. else yeah so it was it's been a very interesting almost 50 years that's mm -hmm. happened in my life all right. Well, I'd just like to close here by thanking you for taking the time to come in and share the story. It was my pleasure, and I hope I can help others. I never seen such desolation. You just, I think we drove for a mile, and there wasn't a building hardly standing. Nobody knew what was going on. They called the situation fluid, but fluid means that nobody knew anything. It was different. If I had done something else, I don't know what I would have done.